so glad you're here this morning. So back to the brief sermon. I want to talk to you this morning uh, in, a, in a way that uh, uh, I'm going to think you already believe this way. But you know what? We're on Facebook. So we're, we're on YouTube. So I don't know who will hear this in the future or who will even hear it today. And perhaps you're not quite sold on this. But I'm going to talk to you this morning that there's no other way than through Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, to be saved. And nobody wants to rock that boat. Everybody starts screaming, you're judging, you're judging when you start doing We're not judging anybody, but we're going to talk about what the Word of God says, in, both in the wording of it and in the object lesson that we see in it. So I'm glad you came today. We're not here to start a fight or anything else. But you have, if you don't believe this, you ain't going to, mm, you're judging again, ain't you? You ain't going to be able to make it. There's going to be no way out because the one that's going to do the judge, that's sitting on the throne, is Jesus himself. So he knows those of us that are his and shall be his. Amen? You and I don't have to judge. We're Number one, we're disqualified because we don't know everything. But here's the good part. The judge is also the redeemer. So if you don't know him as redeemer, he's, you can't pull wool over the lamb's eyes. And that's all it is to it. Now then, I'm going to try to remain calm, but I don't think that's going to work for me even already. But I'm glad you're here. Would you stand in honor of God's word this morning? If you don't believe God's word is the inerrant, infallible, inspired, right? Word of God. If you don't believe all that, folks, you're in a world of hurt already. Because when it's just a book to you, what I'm going to say is going to make it, you're not going to be able to receive that. But it's not just a book. Amen? It's inspired. It's inerrant. It's infallible. <laughs> And you know what? It's profitable, the Bible says of itself, it's profitable for doctrine. That's what we're going to study this morning, the doctrine of all doctrines. Amen? Okay, good, good. Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. All right, everybody ready? It's going to be the NLT this morning. Give me a break. <laughs> Y'all are wearing me down with that NLT, but we will have some KJV in there. Brother Dave, take it away. Look at this. Acts, Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, it says. Acts chapter 4, verse 8 in the New Living Translation says this. <clears throat> then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Sorry. I'm, I'm, it, I'm looking at, at NLT, but I'm reading King James. <laughs> filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Verse 10, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone which you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Twelve. Pay close attention. This is a goodie and a biggie. It's plain. Okay? It's, it's plain. Thank you, Brother Dave. I was going to keep saying that until somebody said Amen. Here's the plainness of it, folks. Here's the plainness. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Amen. You may be seated. Take the morning off. Whew. Salvation in none other. Folks, we live, we all right? I thought somebody done fell out over there in amongst the, the chairs. I was fixing to make a dash over there. It was just a chair adjustment. Everything's good. 
Now then, back to the story. We live in a day and age when everybody wants you to be PC. Now, PC can mean several things. It can mean pretty cute, okay? It can mean a personal computer, right? But the one that really gets everybody stirred up is, in their opinion, you should be politically correct. There are people that think the Assemblies of God, that's, that's the kind of church you just wandered into this morning, they think that, that we're judgmental. We're not judgmental, we're unyielding about doctrine. We can't, we can't pass judgment any better than anybody else can pass judgment. We're all sinners saved by grace. We're not going to make it without our Jesus unless he saves us and continues to cleanse us. Amen. I don't care how good you are, you can't get good enough. Amen. But politically correct, people don't want you to rock their boat. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The doctrine of Jesus only salvation in him alone, that will rock people's boat. You know why? Because everybody wants to be okay with how they are. When I went to an altar and repented of my sins, God spoke to me to change my way of living. And even though I've been born again, I still can't live good enough. But he expects me to try. So, People, they, well, I believe there's good people here and there's good people. There's good people everywhere, but good is not righteous in the eyes of God. It just can't be. Good won't do it. You can't pass out enough food, pick up enough sticks, mow enough grass, dig up enough, <laughs> reopen some ditches, you know. You, you, can, you can't give enough clothes. You can't give enough money, attend enough church services. That, uh, none of that... All of that should be done, but that's not your salvation. It won't add to your salvation. We're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus, in that name, that name, whereby we must be saved. That's the only name. That's the only way. It's not assemblies of God. It's not Baptist. It's Bible. Amen? So don't let anybody get, get you all worked up about that except for you standing on the Word of God because it is infallible and we will be judged. We will be judged by someone who's qualified to judge us as to how we reacted, responded to the Word of God. And he said this is the only God, the Creator, the one that has every right to call the shots on me and you. He is the one that says, you believe in my Son, that's fine. You, I, you're saved. You don't. You, will, you <laughs> brother Aiden, read this morning in our in our new to first class, which we just finished up, about the second death. That's the resurrection unto damnation. Okay, we all get all worked up about the first one, and we ought to. But I'll tell you what, that second one's going to be a doozy. Moving right along, PC politically correct. Don't rock my boat. You're judgmental. You shouldn't do that. Well, the Word of God is, you know what? That's the owner's manual, and he owns us. <laughs> That's the creator's manual, if you will. And we're supposed to line up with it or be judged according to our, hmm, what? Rejection of it. Amen? PC, politically correct. Man, and I get tired of that stuff. Everybody's going to heaven. Why? Because they die. No, that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. Those that know Christ, for them to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? <laughs> we, need to, we need to get solid on this, folks, and don't let the world around us rock our boat. Sometimes I want to... <clears throat> sometimes I disagree with certain, certain things that are said. And it's all because they're trying to water down and rubberize, whoo, rubberize the Word of God. Almost went Elmer Fudd on you there and wubblewized the Word of God, but I didn't. So we handled that real well. The Word of God is the Word of God. It is, it is, it is harder than concrete. It is never failing. And if, the, if, the, if God said it, it's just so. Time can't change what God said. And what he meant is, it, it, 2019 is worrying me. I'd like to know what's going to happen next year, but I can't tell. I don't have 2020 vision. 
I heard that yesterday. I thought that was so good. I couldn't hardly wait to get here to tell you. You get it, 2020? Y'all got that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, okay, just say. You didn't get it, 20. It's the year. Tw- <laughs> Neither is there salvation in no one else. <laughs> God's given no other name. And see, people, people want to rock the boat. They want, they want everybody to be saved. Well, you know what? You just, everybody can be saved. They just have to go through Jesus. God's not willing that he should perish. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked. But why won't people get saved? Why? Because they want to do things their own way. You and I wanted to do our own way until we surrendered, submitted, repented. I surrender all, that old song said. Not almost some of it, part of it, or anything else. It's I surrender all. He told us. He told us how to pray. He said, thy will be done on earth. That encompasses us. Thank you, Brother Ricky. Amen. As it is in heaven. We're, we're, we're supposed to line up with the Word of God. And you know what? When we fall short, it's okay that we fall short. We still don't change the Word of God because of us. This, there is no such thing as Burger King salvation. You can't have it your way. It's going to be God's way or no way. Okay. Now then, it's going to be brief, and we're going to turn it to Brother Bernard, and he's going to serve communion for us. <clears throat> now then, I want to do my best to prove to you why we are so adamant that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I just quoted King James. I'm sorry. It was in LT. It should be. I should have read it. But here's the thing, folks. This is what God said, okay? Now we're going to look at something that is an object lesson that God put in there to show us. Everybody understands about object lessons, right? Is something that happened, but it's, it's got a meaning to it, right? Okay, we're going to go to the building of the tabernacle, and we're going to go, Sister Opal, to the veil. To the veil. Take it away, Brother Dave. I love electronics when it's working right. These guys back there make it work right, so praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 26, verse 30. I can breathe easier now. It's King James Version. Now listen to this. It's going to be several verses, but don't go to sleep on me, okay? Everybody ready? What we first read was what God said about how to be saved. Now we're going to see an object lesson about how to be saved that will prove to me, in my opinion, the same thing that's already been said that we read in the book of Acts. Here we go. Let's look at the veil. Verse 30 says, And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was shewed thee and shown thee in the mount. Amen? 31. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and twine, fine twined <laughs> linen, that's hard to say, of cunning work with cherubims stuck on the side. Okay? Shall it be made. Verse 32. Bear with me. We're getting there. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon the four sockets of silver. 33. And thou shalt hang up the veil upon the tatches. I love tatches. I guess tatches is where you attach it, right? That's what I'm guessing it is, upon the tatches, okay? Upon the tatches. That thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. That is the literal presence of God, but it's in a box, right? Amen. That's what that represents, amongst other things. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Right? Verse 34. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. That tent, that tabernacle of meeting, it was a rectangular thing. And guess what? In the very back part of it, that was where the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubims on top and the mercy seat is, okay? This is under the old law. This is under the old covenant. This, this, this is what's going on. And everything in that thing has a meaning and a symbolism, amen? Okay, very good. So they put the veil up so that you and I and the priest, if you will, the priest, could not get to that ark of the testimony, the ark of the covenant. 
I had it written down in my notes, which I never bring to the pulpit, hardly ever. The veil prevented mankind from getting to God, okay? But it also provided protection so that man couldn't get to God. You know why? They drop. They didn't have Jesus. You and I are the clean people. I don't care what kind of soap you use. I'm not talking about that. You know what I'm talking about. We have been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are clean, not perfect except in Him. When God looks at us, He sees Christ's perfection. Aren't you glad? I don't want Him to see me. Amen? This old fruit tree right here got some blighted fruit. Wormholes. Amen? Little mildew, little mold. Some kind of strange plague called humanity. I can't get in the presence of holy God unless I am cleansed and perfect in Christ. That's the only way. Now remember, this is a symbolism we're looking at here. At here. That veil was put up there. When that veil was put up, he told them how to build it, but it doesn't have an opening in it. Yes? No. It doesn't, that veil does not have an opening in it. Nobody went behind it except the high priest once a year. He went then with much blood and he had to go around like someone that was unwelcome to be in there. Do you hear me? He didn't go through a door because it wasn't a door. He didn't go through a hole because it wasn't a hole. He went around by the end and scooted in there with a lot of blood and he better go in with the right frame of mind and heart or he was going to get zapped. I ain't talking about a bug zapper. Yes? So that, that, that veil is up there to separate unholy man from holy God. There's an object lesson coming here. It's a coming. Everybody ready for it? Good. Let's scoot right along. I'm hurrying, Brother Bernard. Not. Next verse. We're back to the time of Jesus when he walked this earth. We're to the gospel of John, and we're to chapter 10 and verse 9 in the King James Version, praise the Lord. I want, to listen, I want you to think about, listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what we read in Acts, that nobody can be saved except going through Jesus, him being your Savior, yes? Okay, now then, we've got, we've got this in the back of our mind. We've got the, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, okay? And we've got the holy place, God, where we want to be. We need to be with God, don't we? Amen. But we can, back then, before Jesus, you couldn't get to it. The veil was put up there to separate people from God, to say, keep them in safekeeping but they were not saved yet. They couldn't go there. God didn't put a door in it because he's telling them there's a reason there's not a door in there. See if you can figure it out. Right? Okay. So here we go. Now we move way on up to where Jesus is born and on the earth and doing ministry. And out of his mouth come these words. He says, and you've heard me say it a hundred times since I've been here, I, Jesus said, I am. Right? Right? It's one of those I am statements in there. But look at what he says, I am. Jesus said, Jesus says, I am the door. Yes. That's good music, isn't it? Praise God. Amen. By me, he says. Jesus is speaking of his own self, right? By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He and go and shall go in and out and find pasture. Now that sounds strange. I mean, I liked it all the way up till he, he threw pasture in there. I said, Lord, what's going on here? Well, see, when you put it in context, what you find out is he's bouncing back and forth to us and him in human beings and also to him being a good shepherd and us being his sheep. Okay? And that's why this is, this is pulled right out of the middle of all that going on. But when it said pasture, I thought, now, why didn't they just stay with the human stuff? Why didn't they put pasture on there? And so I looked it up. It's a Greek word. It is uh, 
Name, yes, name, that's what it is. It's a Greek word. And you know what? When you look, at, look up the definition of it, what it means is, it means everything you and I need to live a true life. Amen? It's not talking about grass and water, though he provides that if you're in the grass. I'm talking about the eating kind. I just have to qualify that. So here we go with this. He's the provider for everything you and I need. But look at what he says. I am the door. Now, we're down here in the sunny south. We say the, right? Unless you're at the assembly. But the door. But I would like to bring this to another level here if, if I can and say I am the door. I am the one and only door. See, I don't think I'm stretching this thing out of proportion here when I say that. He said, I am the door, not one of the doors. You can't be anything else. You're going to go through him or you ain't getting there. You will go as a trespasser rather than a family member. Amen? <coughs> I am the door. Now then, I think this is just, this is just all this stuff just blows me away. Okay? It blows me away. When I first started reading the Bible, right after I got saved, hadn't read the Bible, didn't know anything about it, and started reading it, and then started watching things fold together and match up, and it just became the most marvelous stuff. I have a vivid imagination, and the Holy Ghost takes it most of the time. And boy, I have me a time as he enlightens me and shows me things. So we've got in the book of Acts where it's declared that there's no other name other than Jesus. That's the only way you can be saved. We've got the Old Testament. We've got in there about the, the Ark of the Covenant and that, and that veil and the presence of God to keep that veil to keep us out. And it doesn't have a door in it. And then you, you move on up here to Jesus and in one of his teachings when he's on the earth, he says this. Thank you, John, for, for writing it down. I am the door. Does he look like a door? What's he talking about? Oh, he's the doorway to God. He's fixing, and you know what? I look. Hmm. This is exciting. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one. We're now going to Jesus' death. This is the hard part about about preaching. See, I'm a teacher. I want to. I would love to take you through every one of these things, and we, you'd have to stay here for days and quit your job. But I don't want to do that. But uh, you know, somebody's got to pay tithes around here. We want the air and the, and the lights on, don't we? We want the preacher fed too. Moving right along. Look at what happens. This is the recording of what happened when Christ died. Even though I'm having to pull these things out of different places and I'd love to teach it straight through. Look at this. At that moment, when Jesus died, at that moment, the curtain, that's the veil in the sanctuary, yes? Very good. Thank you for paying attention. The veil, the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. There wasn't a way through before. But at his death, uh, the thing was torn in two. It wasn't torn into strips. It was one curtain, and it was torn in two that you may go through the only opening in it to get to God. See? See? So don't, don't let people start all this stuff and tell you that all the good people's going that you're not going to have, none of us are going to heaven unless we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Unless we accept His death to give us life. Amen? And people all over the world are telling you, you judge your hard, your hard nose, your hardcore. Uh, there's good people doing it. There's good people doing a lot of stuff. But you can only get to heaven and be right in the eyes of God if you go through God's door. And people just don't don't let them don't don't let them don't let them change your mind. Don't let them soften you. This doctrine cannot be changed. If it does, you will not be saved. You're propagating damnation then instead of eternal life. Okay, well, it meant a lot to me. Look at this. Brother Menard, I'm fixing to steal part of your scripture. 
We still friends? Okay. See, we're going to, this all got started because of, well, it got started because, it got started because I came in here to pray, but I never got to pray. I told Sister Becky, I said, be in the sanctuary for a few minutes. Yes, sir. Two minutes later, I said, get in a sermon, got to go back. I, I, and you remember when I went back to my office? That's what this was all, I, I couldn't even come in here and pray. I had to go back and make notes. Okay. And it was all about this because we're going to have the Lord's Supper here just in a little bit even though it's lunch. Okay? We're going to have this. And we're going to hope and try our best to get in a, in a frame of mind spiritually to where we can have communion with Him. Amen? All right. Let's look at some scripture. Brother Bernard, you're welcome to still go ahead and use these. But I got them first. Let me use them, then you can have them. Okay, next scripture. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. This is what Brother Bernard always brings out as he serves us communion. He'll bring this out right here. He'll say, <clears throat> every time, this 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. We're back to the NLT, but it's going to be all right. For every time you eat this bread, that, that little piece of cracker thingy, okay, and drink this cup, that, that little bit of juice, okay, it says you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Every time you do that, that's why this is serious business here. He's going to go on and tell us why it's serious business and how it is. 27. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. Verse 29, for if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon your own self. That's about Jesus' body and blood. That's about what he gave for us. He gave his life. He died for us so that we could live for him. And he is the one, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So don't let people change you up on that. You start letting them change you up on that, you know what's going to happen? It won't be long till this right here won't mean what it means to you or what it should mean. Don't soften, folks. You can't soften that. Okay, we want to be soft-handed. We want to love people. We want to help people. We want to do good works to them. We want to love the lost. We want to love those that are in, as Brother Hunter said, the devil didn't care which ditch he got you in, the ditch of the unsaved or the ditch of the wrong believing. But you know what? It doesn't matter which ditch they're in. We love them. We love people because of their image, not because of their actions and decisions. They're created in the image of God. We all are. Aren't you glad somebody loved us? Amen. Huh. He says, With, without, if you eat and drink this cup, without honoring the body of Christ in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Verse 30, it gets a little worse. Okay? That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. Now, don't get all worked up. Let's just know this is serious business, right? Look at 31. But if we would examine ourselves, ourselves, not your spouse, not somebody else, not what somebody else said, if we'd examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. I am happy to know, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt today that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Amen? I'm happy that I've confessed that. I'm, I, I've, I've confessed it to him. I've confessed it before you. Now, say, well, pastor, I just wish I had a whole lot of, you know what, some days I don't have a whole lot of faith. Some days I don't even feel saved. But you know what the great part about it is? He keeps the covenant with me for Jesus' sake, through Jesus. Amen? Amen. Oh, Lord. So you know what? Ain't nobody got it made as good as we got it made. But folks, hold to that doctrine. It's not because you're, you're, uh, uh, 
you know what? Whether someone's saved or not saved, that doctrine doesn't change. It's in Christ alone. Jesus of Nazareth. See? It's not, there's been a lot of good people to die, but good people can't take away sin. It's only the perfect, sinless Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, He can take away sin. Amen? Don't let the world change you, folks. Don't, don't, let them, don't let them browbeat you and tell you, you, you know, you're too mean. You're judging people whenever you say, folks, you hold on to that doctrine and you hold on. It will be your life, your life preserver, your life giver and your life preserver. When the, when the, <laughs> when the storms of this life hit, Jesus will be there for you. When we stand in judgment before him, it will be him we stand. And he'll say, huh, there you are. There you are. I know you, right? The Bible tells us he ever lives to, to make intercession for us right now. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. Amen? Ever lives to make intercession for us. That one's mine, Father. That one's mine. That one's mine. That one's mine. Huh? How wonderful. How great our God is. Folks, don't throw, don't throw away or, or dilute the only hope of heaven you and I have. Just hold to it. Teach your kids this. Teach your grandkids. Teach your, your, your wife or husband, whoever you got, okay? Well, teach them. Teach them. Tell it to them. And let them know that, you know what? There may be good people in all sorts of other things and doing all sorts of great humanity. Nice things to people that, that need help. Humanitarian was the word I was trying to get out. But you know what? They can't be saved doing that. Should we do them? Because, yeah, it's because we are saved. It's because we are saved we do that. But that's not, our, that's not our salvation. Our salvation is in Christ alone. I think when we get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, I, I, as, as a song, I think when we all get to heaven, I think we will be amazed at who is up there and we'll be amazed at who isn't. Okay, every head bowed. Every eye closed. Brother Bernard, up to the front, please. We're about to pray. And let me tell you what I always do. I pray a prayer of repentance. I do it every month when we have the Lord's Supper. But I don't do it to get resaved, if you will. That's not what that's about at all. That's about telling Jesus that I just can't make it without him that he's kept me, and I need him to continue keeping me. <coughs> so if you will, if you will, if you'd like to say that prayer of repentance with me, then here we go. Repeat it after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and God the Son and the Son of Man, that you came to this earth to die for me so that I can live for you. I thank you, Lord, that you have cleansed me and you continue to cleanse me. I must have you, Jesus. I cannot make it any other way, but I thank you, Jesus, for who you are and how you are, that you never, ever give up on me. <laughs> My name, Lord, is in your book, the book of life. And I thank you, Lord, for coming to this earth to rescue me. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.